Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at the key differences between pulse width modulation and pulse frequency modulation when driving switch mode power supplies. Both methods are commonly used, but they each have specific benefits and drawbacks. Let's start off by looking at how these two modulations work and how they are implemented. So in general, while a switching converter is kept in continuous conduction mode, the output to input voltage ratio can be set with some sort of duty cycle based function. This duty cycle being defined as the ratio between the switches on time divided by the total switching period. So to change the output voltage, adapt to variations in input voltage, or just adapt to variable load conditions, the control circuit needs to adjust the duty cycle parameter. Now one important observation to be made here is that there is no frequency present in this function. In other words, nobody is forcing you to keep the converter running at one frequency or another. The only thing you actually need to control is the ratio of on to off time. So finally, to achieve this, there are two main methods, pulse width modulation and pulse frequency modulation. With pulse width modulation, you keep the switching period and thus the switching frequency constant, and you just adjust the duty cycle strictly by modifying the on time, so the width of the pulse is being adjusted, while with pulse frequency modulation, normally you just adjust the switching frequency while keeping either the on or off time as constant. So the pulse width is being fixed, but the pulse frequency is being varied. So both of these methods will achieve the target of changing the duty cycle and thus adjusting the response of the power supply, but the difference is in the exact way in which this goal is being achieved. Now, you can of course build converters running in either pulse width modulation or pulse frequency modulation mode, but it's always easier to observe and perform measurements inside of a circuit simulator. Fortunately, LTSpice does contain a very wide variety of converters, as well as ready-made circuits or test fixtures, which you can play around with. So under power products, you will find the various power supplies that are available. So you can take an IC you know about or just random one from the library. And after opening its test fixture, so this example circuit, you can start playing around with it to see how it works. In general, to observe whether the supply is of one type or another, other than consulting the datasheet, you can play around with either the input voltage, the output load, or the feedback network. Based on the different operating conditions, you should see a difference in the switching node, from which you can determine whether it's a pulse width modulation circuit or a pulse frequency modulation circuit. Now, in general, pulse width modulation topologies are commonly built using either voltage mode or current mode control around sensing the output voltage and the power stage current. And based on this information, a duty cycle is created around a fixed frequency oscillator. So the total pulse frequency is always kept constant by the oscillator, but the width is obtained by comparing the oscillator's triangle wave to the measured and processed voltage and current. With pulse frequency modulation, the circuits also rely on similar output voltage and power stage current sensing as the PVM circuits, but the difference is how the final power stage control is being done. This is most commonly achieved with hysteretic control, which in its simplest form can be implemented with the power stage being driven by a Trigger-Schmidt comparator, which simply observes the output voltage and compares it to some internal reference. With this control, the circuit will either let more current through or it won't. There's no fixed timing, both the on and off time can be variable, and well, this brings certain problems. The main drawback here is that you can't really build all converter types using this method. So this thing will mainly work for buck regulators. A more controlled approach to actually achieve proper pulse frequency modulation can be done using one-shot timers or delay timers. So these will either force the on or off time to a fixed value, and then the other timing is determined by the feedback loop. This allows a more predictable response, as well as allowing the construction of all the power topologies. So this way you will actually have pulse frequency modulation in the sense that one of the timings is kept more or less constant. So one example of a pulse width modulation power supply is the LTC3417. This is a dual output buck converter and I modified the test fixture a bit to get two clearly different output voltages, 
so the feedback resistors are different for the two outputs. If we now run the converter and observe the two switching nodes, and we zoom in a bit where the output is stabilized, and we separate things a bit, so we can observe that the switching frequency is the same in both cases, but the duty cycle clearly isn't. The on time for the first switching node is much smaller than the on time in the second switching node. If we now turn to a pulse frequency modulated supply, we can take the example of the LT3470. So here I made two copies of the same circuit and I just used different feedback resistors to get different output voltages. So if we run this circuit and again we look into the switching node and look at the end where the output is more or less stabilized, we can observe that the on time is almost the same in both cases, but the total period is different. So on the upper side, it's around 3.6 microseconds. On the lower side, it's around 4.2 microseconds. So we have clearly different switching frequencies. Now, both methods, pulse width modulation and pulse frequency modulation, achieve the final goal of regulating the output voltage. But why would you go for one or the other? Well, there are a few aspects to consider. The big topics being efficiency and electromagnetic interference. Now, when it comes to efficiency, it's important to remember what are the exact elements of a converter that use power. So on the one side, you have the power stage related losses. So your conduction loss when the switch is on and the switching loss when the switch is transitioning between the on and off state. And then you have the control circuit related losses. So all the comparators, amplifiers, oscillators, and whatever else is in there that is needed to be powered. So to understand which control method is better, we need to evaluate these three main aspects. The easiest topic to address here is the on time, or well, the conduction loss. This is load dependent. The more output energy you need, the longer the on time will be. So the modulation scheme does not really matter. For a given steady state, the duty cycle will be the same, so the total on time will be exactly the same in both modulations. The other elements are not this easy though. With the typical pulse width modulation circuit, the control is relatively complex. Multiple blocks are needed, including the oscillator, so it's not uncommon for the quiescent current of a pulse width modulation regulator to be in the milliampere region, even when it's not even switching. In contrast, a pulse frequency modulated circuit can be built extremely simply when that is the specific goal, and thus it's not uncommon to get microampere levels of quiescent current. Finally, the switching losses are directly linked to the converter's switching frequency. The smaller the frequency, the fewer transitions that occur and the less power gets consumed. So with pulse frequency modulation, you switch only as often as is needed, compared to pulse width modulation where the frequency is constant and independent of the load. So because of this, pulse frequency modulation is more efficient. And well, it's more efficient in two of the three categories, and well, the third one is a tie. A final interesting aspect that can be achieved with pulse frequency modulation is boundary or critical conduction mode. So with continuous conduction mode, the inductor current constantly varies, and with discontinuous conduction mode, the current momentarily stops at zero, but with boundary conduction mode, the current continuously varies while also touching the zero mark. The significance of this is that you keep the efficiency benefits of zero current switching observed in discontinuous conduction mode, but you minimize the peak currents and other oscillations that might appear by keeping the circuit in a continuous conduction state. In essence, boundary conduction mode is more efficient than discontinuous conduction mode, and you can only achieve it under multiple operating conditions whilst in pulse frequency modulation mode. This will not really work with pulse width modulation. In general, when efficiency is key, some form of pulse frequency modulation is used. It's not uncommon for converters to use both methods, so to use pulse width modulation at high load and to change to pulse frequency modulation at lower loads, to keep efficiency high under all conditions. So for example, the LTC3417 we looked at previously has three main operating modes, force continuous conduction mode, pulse skipping mode and burst operation. Now at relatively high loads, all three of these modes have more or less the same efficiency, the supply is basically running as a pulse width modulator with continuous conduction, 
but at smaller loads the efficiency is different based on the selected method. With force continuous mode the supply is highly inefficient, the inductor always needs to conduct some current, efficiency is slightly better under pulse skip mode, so with this less switching is going on, but large parts of the IC are still running, including the oscillator, and finally with burst mode everything can be shut off, and the IC is activated only when switching needs to happen. So this is the most efficient switching mode of this particular IC. And if you're curious, the datasheet also contains the various measurement plots for the various operating modes. The last aspect to mention is the noise. Ask any EMC engineer and they will tell you definitely pulse width modulation is better. Stay away from pulse frequency modulation. But why? So the big problem here is the exact spectrum of the noise. With a switching converter, the noise will contain the fundamental switching frequency and the upper harmonics. With a pulse width modulation scheme, these are very well established. So if you know exactly where your main sensitive limits are, you can adjust the switching frequency to be just outside of these. And well, this way you can limit your electromagnetic interference problems. With pulse frequency modulation, the fundamental frequency can be found in quite a large frequency interval, based on the exact use case. So the input voltage, output load and output voltage setting. Therefore it's very difficult to predict the final noise behavior of the system, since you would need to test it multiple use cases to observe each noise spectrum. It's not necessarily that the circuit is more noisy, but rather the noise is less predictable than with pulse width modulation. So with the pulse width modulated converter, set to run with a variable input voltage, so I set the input voltage to be a 5 volt with a 1 volt sine wave on top of it, so to force a variation in the duty cycle, if we let the circuit run a bit and then observe the two switching nodes, so on one side there's a larger load, on the other there's a smaller load, there's a variation in the input voltage, and we perform a FFT analysis on the waveforms, we can observe that the noise spectrum is more or less the same. So there are no new frequencies appearing, it's always the exact same peaks, just with small variations in amplitude. So even though we are running different loads and there's a variation in the input voltage, the noise is more or less the same. In contrast, if we now take our pulse frequency modulated circuits, so here again there are different output loads and the input voltage is a sine wave, so it's a 8 volt DC level with a 2 volt sine wave on top, if we again look at the switching nodes and we perform the same FFT analysis, so here because of the variation in the voltage the switching frequency varied, so we can see that the frequency is not a fixed value but rather it spreads left and right, and then because of the load again there's a very clear variation in between the switching frequency peaks. So you can make the assumption that under a real life use case the converter could run anywhere in the complete interval given by these two sets of peaks and while the harmonics will again be all over the place. So from an electromagnetic interference point of view, this is highly undesirable since the exact noise spectrum is completely situation dependent. In general, you will see both modulation methods used in practice. Pulse width modulation and pulse frequency modulation based converters are selected based on what the exact use case requires. For high efficiency, you will get pulse frequency modulation, and for high predictability in operation, you will get pulse width modulation. Of course, when you need a bit of both worlds, you will end up using both worlds. It's not uncommon to use some form of pulse frequency modulation at light loads and pulse width modulation at higher loads. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you can check out in the following links. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.